Back in the day, fans could buy highlight tapes of the best NHL fights on VHS. More recently, interest in shirt pulling fisticuffs seems to have waned a bit as Amazon.com doesn't sell a single fight compilation on Blu-ray. But you can still buy classic hockey fights on DVD, and those who long for the good old days can read Hockey Fights of Yesteryear, a look back at the careers of classic NHL enforcers. So although interest in fights appears to have shifted to the UFC and other mixed martial art events, fights still happen on the ice. A few years ago, I overheard a couple of academics discussing the problem of hockey fighting. They were both really smart, but neither had any direct experience in ice hockey. And it became clear that they hadn't spent much time talking with hockey players either. But they pressed on toward their goal of ending hockey fighting by creating and implementing an anger management program. But their program didn't really go anywhere. At the Olympic, college, and youth levels, fighting is controlled more strictly, and efforts to end fighting are more sincere. Fights don't break out in the NHL as much as they used to, but fights remain an accepted part of the game in many minor leagues. One of my graduate professors used to remind us to always understand a problem before you try to fix it. And the well-meaning academics I mentioned hadn't taken the time to understand the problem of hockey fighting before they tried to find a solution. And despite being very smart and very well educated, they committed what I will call the equifinality error, meaning they assumed that all instances of a single outcome are occasioned by a single cause. About 20 years ago, one of my postdoctoral mentors, Dante Cicchetti, published a paper called Equifinality and Multifinality in Developmental Psychology, which adapted these principles from embryology, or the study of how embryos develop, to child development and psychopathology. Cicchetti and Rogash indicated that multifinality means that individuals may begin on the same major pathway and as a function of their subsequent choices, exhibit very different patterns of adaptation or maladaptation. Put differently, multifinality means that from one origin, you can get different outcomes. So if you start with 10 maltreated children, you may not end up with 10 children displaying the same sort of psychopathology later in life, or any sort of psychopathology for that matter. Even though maltreatment does increase the probability. It also means that if 10 hockey players get really angry during a hockey game, they won't all instigate fights. On the other hand, Cicchetti and Rogosh indicated that equifinality means that the same end state may be reached from a variety of different initial conditions and through different processes. Put differently, equifinality means that a single outcome, such as, such as a young adult displaying the symptoms of ADHD or a fight breaking out between two players in a hockey game, can be the result of many causes. So just as ADHD is not caused by a single gene, and probably not even by a combination of genes, hockey fights don't all start because of a single cause, such as anger. Some theorists, instinct theorists, would have us believe that hockey players who fight are prompted by some sort of Freudian Thanatos-like drive. Others would say that the player was no longer able to tolerate the frustration experienced when their goals were blocked by an opponent, as in the frustration-aggression hypothesis. But this isn't always the case. So if hockey fights don't break out between two opponents got angry at each other, why do they break out? This isn't an area I've devoted a lot of my time as a researcher to, but having played hockey a little and as a former adolescent male, I know of a few reasons, but there are probably many more that I won't mention. First, in hockey culture, traditionally fights are a way of ensuring that smaller skilled players aren't bullied by stronger opponents. And having a so-called enforcer is supposed to act as a deterrent to opposing players who might want to take cheap shots against the other team's goal scorer. 
Second, it's a way of getting noticed. Teenagers playing in the junior leagues are often trying to get to a higher level. And participating in fights is one way of showing scouts that they're tough. So fighting is a way of showing off to talent, talent evaluators and groupies, by the way, who are affectionately known as puck bunnies. Third, it's fun. Okay, I probably shouldn't admit this, but in high school, when the UFC was in its infancy, some of my high school friends would get together at a friend's house and we'd watch Hoist Gracie and Dan Severn and Ken Shamrock duke it out in the octagon. Then, with our testosterone at unusually high levels, we would go into the backyard, get on a 15-foot trampoline, and beat the out of each other. So as you can imagine, we didn't go on the trampoline because we were angry at each other. We went out there because, as 15-year-olds, we thought it was fun. And when I've talked to hockey players, many smile when the topic of fighting comes up because they think it's fun. And they think it's funny that moms assume every fight breaks out over anger or personal vendetta. If you go to a minor league hockey game, pay close attention to the players when the score gets out of hand. You'll sometimes see opponents skate towards each other after a whistle and ask, you wanna go? And once the puck is dropped, they throw down their gloves, their teammates skate away, and they entertain the fans with a bout of fisticuffs. So Albert Bandura's social learning theory provides a better explanation for why hockey players fight than the psychoanalytic and drive theories of the past. In Bandura's classic Bobo doll study, he demonstrated that when children watch someone model aggressive behaviors, they are more likely to act in aggressive ways, especially if they see the model reinforced for those behaviors. And when teammates see players reinforced for fighting by crowds, coaches, and scouts, it's easy to see why some players would be motivated to fight, even if they aren't mad at anyone on the opposing side, and why their behavior influences the behavior of children who look up to them. Do hockey players sometimes get seriously hurt while fighting? Yes. Does it set a bad example for children? Yes. Is hockey fighting something that should be banned entirely? Maybe. But if someone wanted to end hockey fighting once and for all, would an anger management program be the best way to accomplish this goal? Absolutely not. Because hockey fighting isn't always about anger. Sometimes it is, but often it isn't. If you still don't believe me, take a look at the behavior of hockey players after a fight. Sometimes you'll see them continue to make threatening remarks and hostile facial expressions as they're crowded into the penalty box or into the locker room. But in many cases, you'll see players slap each other on the butt or the head after the referee has broken up the fight, as if to say, nice job, bro. It's a mutual show of respect. General misunderstandings of hockey fighting provide a really good example of the equifinality principle, that an outcome like a fight breaking out is not always occasioned by a single cause, such as anger. And the general misunderstanding of hockey fighting also provides a reminder that we must first understand a problem before we try to fix it. So if someone was interested in curtailing fights, they might want to at least talk with a few hockey players before they try to change their behavior. So yes, hockey fights sometimes break out because one or more players have lost their temper. But hockey fights don't always break out because someone is angry. And that's why an anger management program wouldn't be a complete solution to the problem of hockey fighting.